Thank you. Um, please don't try to think during my talk what this has got to do with program modeling and learning. <laughs> it will distract you, right? <laughs> I, I don't have a, an outline. The title is so long, please take this as the outline of the paper. <laughs> so we jump right into the matter, and that is repairing malformed programs. Here's one. Quite a simple one. There's a class with two methods, one n with an inter integer argument and void return type, um, which is overloaded by two other methods which have been commented out. So it's not important at this time. And then another one called n, which is int and string uh, argument type and the return something. And then I have outside that class c, I have some client code which basically calls n to the strings argument and returns the, uh, uh, stores the result in i. So as you sure see, this program is malformed. What does your favorite IDE tell you about this error? Have a short guess. Well, it says that the method call is not applicable for the argument string, which is correct, right? And it suggests two fixes. One is change the method signature up here to the string argument. And the other is to create a new method of type string. So I got one here already, um, and I will use this. There's still a problem, of course. What do you think the next method will be? Think a while. Well, the IDE is quite clever. Um, it realizes that this one is no, not accessible, and therefore it changes the visibility, or suggests a fix changing the visibility to package. It does not suggest creating a new method, as it did before, or changing the argument type, which would cause another error, because then there would be two methods with the same uh, signature. Java doesn't allow. Okay. So what if I decide that I don't want a string argument but an object argument? What is it going to su suggest this time? Have a short guess and then see. Well, roughly the same. It wants to change the accessibility. It does not, even though it could, suggest changing the argument type to string or introducing a new one, string. So why is that? Well, you can tell by the messages that you can see here that these fixes have been handcrafted, okay? It complains about a method with type object, and then it refers to that method as a parameterless method. So this has probably been manually done, and this is a small slip. Right. So quick fixes are added for specific error messages in IDEs. Okay. Slightly more complicated, only slightly. I combine two problems into one. We have now this method with a, with a bad argument type and a lack of accessibility. So what is the IDE going to do? Well, first it suggests the same as in the initial example, changing the method signature. Well, I take the first choice and change the method signature as suggested. What's going to happen now? Next error. It's not accessible. Okay, but it has a fix for that. So I can increase accessibility. Now I'm fine. No, still not fine, why? The return type. Okay, this is void, but I need an integer here. But there's still a, a fix offered for this, namely to change the type from void to integer. Now I'm done. No, but this time, I have an error message here. There's a return statement missing. And at this point, I realize n, which doesn't return anything, is not the right method, okay? So I went through all these fixes only to realize, oh no, I'm wrong. So what do I do? I undo all these changes. And at this point, I have no alternatives. So I think about it myself and realize, well, I just change, um, I just change Oh, that's the wrong highlight, not C. M to N, right? And now I'm done. This was not offered. So what does the IDE do, or the tool support? It offers me some incomplete suggestions, uh, which are somewhat short-sighted. And we have termed this situation the fixing odyssey, because you have to go through a long path only to realize that this is not what you wanted, and that you have to backtrack, and so on and so forth. You have to do all this by yourself. So we can do a lot better than that. And this is what um, um, we want to do in this talk, show in this talk. First, I summarize 
um, what we have. We have two specifications and or implementations for uh, one for checking and one for fixing performance errors. And as always, when you have two specifications, um, there's uh, there are problems with completeness. One may not be include the same cases as the other, and the two may be inconsistent. And as tool builders, this is really sad because we're missing an opportunity here. So what would we want instead? We want, this is your, the second program that I showed you. We want a fixed suggestion, or actually we want two fixed suggestions. One, pointing me to all things I should change at once, and not forgetting any of the options that I have. So this is where we want to go. For those of you who are interested in usability, um, just a word of warning, um, bad fixes have their use. I learned something about my mistake. I learned something about the programming language. Um, maybe they point me to deeper problems in my program, so that I may find them useful. And also, that they are used. They can be used why I evolve the program, not only for correcting it. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have programmed, handcrafted quick fixes. But what we are actually going for is something that doesn't cost us anything, and it's automatically correct, right? we are after the free lunches. So how can we do this? Well, the idea is to have one spec that suits both purposes, checking and repair. And the general idea of this is, is that we have some kind of decision procedure that uh, an oracle for well-formed list. So I feed it a program, it tells me whether it's well-formed or not. And then I have a malformed program, one that does not pass the decision procedure. And then I need a set of changes, of elementary changes, to the program so that the program passes my decision procedure. So that is correct. And I have a few um, side conditions for that. One is that the, the changes should be, in a way, minimal. Not necessarily exactly minimal, but small. Because, uh, I mean, it's always possible to repair a program by replacing it with Hello World. It's well formed, and you're done. But that's not the objective. And the other is we should not do it all automatically, but the programmer should be given a choice of, of various fixes, so, um, and hopefully the one that he actually wanted is among them. And this is essentially a search problem. The procedure that I just showed you is generate and test, just generate changes on new programs and see whether they pass the, um, um, the way form this oracle, but this is not very efficient, so we cannot do with that. Um, also, from the initial example, um, you may have seen that we suggested fixes that do not introduce new errors. We have come to call these um, deep fixes as opposed to shallow fixes, which are elementary fixes. Both kinds of fixes should fix the problem they were immediately applied to or to which for which they were offered. But shallow fixes will just do that. That is, they can introduce new errors while fixing the old one. And in case you think that this is uh, something very exotic or academic, we did some evaluation, and this shows you the front row shows the number of um, problems a single fix can fix at a time. So most fixes fix a single problem without it. The first time means a new, uh, zero new introduced errors. A small number can accidentally fix two problems. But in the second row, you see um, the fixes that fix one error and introduce one or even may introduce two or more. So you can see everything that's before this diagonal fixes more errors than it introduces, and every that's everything that's behind this diagonal um, makes it only worse, right? And if in case you think, oh, well, this is not a problem because I can then now af apply my, uh, my shallow fixes to the resulting problem, well, this is not the case. We repeated the procedure for the outcoming programs, and you can see that it actually gets worse. So I get more. Um, uh, cases here in the, in the front half of the picture, so I yeah, actually introduce more errors than I fix. No, sorry, in the back half, so I introduce mo more errors than I fix. So this this kind of deep fixing is actually uh, something that one would probably want to have, um, and of course the problem is that they cost something. They are more expensive to co to compute than the shallow fixes. Um, Again, we're not suggesting that users will be happy with this. Uh, we're just uh, trying to exploit the technical possibilities. Um, how can this be done? Well, the one specific for the one specification, we chose um, attribute grammars, or more precisely, reference, or as they sometimes call.
about remote attribute grammars. Now I was told Uxla um, is not proper or PLDI, which probably means that not all of you in the room know attribute grammars. Is that correct? Uh, no. You all know attribute grammars? <laughs> A lot, lot of uh, nodding. So I can speed up on the next slide. Um, well, what do they do? They take a parse tree and attach attributes to the nodes of the parse, parse tree. Um, where there's one special kind of attribute that we have to spay, uh, uh, pay special attention to, which are called intrinsic attributes. These are the attributes that get their values directly from the program. All other attribute values need to be computed by equations, which are supplied to the attribute grammar. And um, these equations can be divided into two categories. One is called semantic functions or attribution rules, which pass information from, from um, nodes up or down in the parse tree to other nodes. And the other called context conditions, which are basically uh, predicates that decide whether the program is well formed or not. And because these context conditions involve information that comes from other nodes of the, um, of the syntax tree, it's not no longer context free, and so attribute grammars are context sensitive. Um, to give you an example how this works um, and how I can derive this error message from these two um, Java expressions, um, we're going to look at a very simple rule. This is all very uh, simplified. We have an assignment rule, uh, a syntactic rule here, which says the assignment has on the left-hand side a variable access and a method access expression. And then I have a context condition here, which requires that for this assignment, oh, oops, it should be an equals because I simplified it, the type of the uh, method ex uh, access expression is the same as that of the variable access type. So when I apply this rule to the program, to this expression up here, when I pass it, I get these nodes. There's an assignment, and here's the method access expression on the right-hand side and the variable access on the left-hand side. We have an intrinsic in, uh, attribute here, which has a value, um, which is int. The int is not shown from the declaration. So you can consider this as intrinsic at this point. But this is not the only rule for this um, expression. We have another one for the a detailed one for the method uh, access expression. And this sort of divides this into a receiver expression and the identifier of the method that's being invoked and the argument expression. We assume that there's only a single argument here. Again, I have an intrinsic um, attribute, which is the name of the, um, the function that's being invoked. This is, this is n, okay? And now you see that this, um, this rule here adds a few more equations to this node. And one equation being that the type of the method access expression is actually the return type of the access method. But where is the access method? It's not seen here. Well, the access method is computed by a lookup which with the receiver type, the name, and the argument type expression, and it's passed somewhere else. It's up here. And so what this actually does, it, it, it assigns a value to a reference attribute. So this node up here, which is not in a parent um, or child relation to the other nodes, is access via a reference. You'll need that later. Now, the point with the attribute grammars is that you can actually evaluate all these equations only if there's an evaluation order. And this evaluation order is really bottom up from the intrinsic attribu attributes up to the computed ones. And then, in general, you shouldn't have cycles or you're in trouble. But this is not our point. Um, we leave this to the grammar. And uh, for our uh, solution, we do not really need it. Unfortunately, uh, we can rely on a tool here for Java, namely just add and the extend J compiler, which um, has some really uh, nice features that take care of all these technical problems. Um, so now the idea is to change from these standard reference attribute grammars to what we have called constraint attribute grammars. What's the basic idea? The basic idea is that the attributes of an attribute grammar correspond to the variables of a constraint satisfaction problem. And also the semantic functions, which are really assignments, correspond to equality constraints of the same constraint satisfaction problem. And the context conditions are constraints anyway. So actually, the parse tree with the attributes and the equations defines a constraint satisfaction problem. And rather than evaluating the expressions of the equations as we did before, we pass them to a constraint solver. And the constraint solver differs from the evaluation and that it can propagate um, values in arbitrary directions, not only bottom up, but also top down, as we 
has seen before. And so we have our two purposes. One is checking as before. And checking, we do that by making all intrinsic attributes that correspond to the lead, to the pr surface properties of the program unchanging. Everything else is changing. And then passing the constraint satisfaction problem to the constraint solver. Now it evaluates all these constraints very much like uh, an attribute grammar does only that the constraint solver can do it in arbitrary directions, so um, circularity is no longer a problem, really. And um, the second purpose is repair. And for repair, we do something different. We make the intrinsic attributes variable and compute new values for them. And these new values for the intrinsic attributes correspond to the intrinsic changes to the program, uh, sorry, to the elementary changes of the, of the program that we are going to present to the user. So how does this work? This is the, um, the, the syntax tree that I showed you before. Here's the assignment. Um, you can see here the intrinsic values in blue, um, intrinsic attributes. They have been assigned their values for checking. Okay. So what the constraint solver does, um, it so tries to solve this, uh, uh, these uh, remaining constraints. As you may have seen, I replaced the assignment with equality here. So these are really uh, just constraints, and it solves these but basically the data flow is the same as it was before for checking. Okay. Um, for repair, it's slightly different. Now, I have replaced all the uh, leads with variables, and now you can see the data flow is in arbitrary directions, okay? Um, what does that mean? Well, if I start here, by uh, selecting from the domain of this variable integer, this integer gets propagated up here, this is the same value, it gets propagated down here, gets propagated here, and from this one, because the result of the access method, because the access method must be a looked up method with a return type integer, it propagates up here, okay? So I look up this method, and the types must be equal, so I propagate the type here. So the solver computed this assignment for an intrinsic attribute, and guess what? This is exactly the fix suggestion made by the, the uh, quick fix by Eclipse. But differing from this example, we, uh, from, from, from this case, we can also have a variation of it. Again, we propagate integer up here, we propagate it down here, and now we try to find a value for access method so that the type is integer. We do this this time by changing the attribute value down here from m to n. Now this refers to that, and here we already have the value integer, and now we're done. And so the only assignment that we did that, sh uh, that was changed is that we changed here from n to n, okay? And this is the other fix, just renaming the method invocation. And we computed that from the very same, uh, same specification using the very same algorithm. The only thing that changed is what was variable and what was not. Okay, so because of shortness of time, I expected that. This is where it gets tricky. Uh, I'm going to skip over it. Um, so in general, we have the problem if we compute all attribute values from scratch, we will end up with a problem that's mostly unrelated to the original one. We want uh, changes to propagate lo uh, locally, uh, a small number of changes. That is why we use local search. And you can easily imagine how this could be done. You just start with a violated constraint and then change one value so that it's no longer um, violated, and then you look at the remaining constraints, and if they got evaluated, you change other values, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a standard search procedure. But this can get very tedious. Um, so what we want to do instead, we want to use the constraint solver for doing all the search for us. Um, but this wouldn't work, if, again, if we use the uh, complete constraint system. So we apply the so uh, a local search procedure to generating the constraint satisfaction problem. We start with a minimal constraint satisfaction problem which consists, which consists only of the immediately violated constraint. We try to solve this. This is impossible. We make constraint var variable and constrain these with all constraints that actually can be applied to the remaining variables and then try to solve it again. If this does not work, we increase the constraint satisfaction problem even further and so on and so forth until we have reached one that is solvable. And from these, we can read our solution. And if the user is not satisfied with what we have, we can always uh, send it back 
And basically, um, what we implemented here is a bounded first, red first, first strategy, which can, of course, be um, made better by using heuristics with domain knowledge from the programming domain. Is this uh, uh, fix may be preferred of another one. But th as soon as you start with, uh, with heuristics, you're done with the free lunches. So these are my final slides. Um, feasibility, can this, is this practical? Well, in general, um, for checking it is not. It lasts way too long. If you take a standard compiler with a standard evaluation order, it's orders of magnitude faster than the constraints solver. But, uh, and also if you do all constraints, you get not only too many constraints in too long times, but also too many solutions. Lo local search does fix this problem, however. Um, other problems may be, which we have not found yet, is that constraint solving may not be expressive enough to cover everything of the language of your choice. That's what the reviewers asked. I have no evidence for this, but of course we cannot exclude this. Um, and in general, it can be very tedious to transform everything that a compiler does, even an, an attribute grammar compiler, into constraints. If you look at the Java language specification with 600 pages, um, Nevertheless, we evaluated it on something else than Java. We uh, evaluated it on the Java persistence a API and its use in a large body of open source programs. And so we were basically checking annotations and suggesting fixes for these annotations. And it worked reasonably well, even for large numbers of constraints and, and large programs, at least well enough to be considered by uh, those who are interested in automatically generating tool support from language specifications. This brings me to the big picture and the final slide. We, what we're really after is not one specification for two purposes, but one specification for n purposes. And you could easily imagine how to do code completion with this refactoring um, and other things like code generation and name binding problems. And this is really the, the, um, the outer project, the umbrella under which it all lies is the constraint-based language tool project. Thank you.